Well, welcome everybody to our interview series. Tonight we're interviewing Joe Felsenstein, who's been with the department quite a while, works in evolutionary and population genetics, and I'm just going to give him an opportunity to talk some about that, starting maybe with where did you start with? How did you get involved in biology? Well, um, I came from uh, Philadelphia and um, grew up there, and my father was um, a commercial artist, which is, does not mean he was a commercially successful fine artist. It means he laid out advertisements for uh, uh, catalog inserts. And my mother was um, uh, a darkroom assistant and photographer, very avid photographer, later a social worker. Um, in the previous generation, my mother's father had been a very successful inventor who invented the some oil oil injection systems for diesel engines, and but he died young, and the family uh, lost all its money in the depression. And I grew up in Philadelphia, and when I was young, I was very shy, and I couldn't seem to find other kids to play with. And my mother um, saw me w looking at birds in the park, and she went out and bought me a bird book, and uh, I became a bird watcher, and so. By the time I got to um, high school, I was convinced I was going to go into wildlife conservation, uh, which is completely ridiculous because I'm the world's most timid field person. I'm always, when I'm camping out, I'm always terrified that I'm going to be eaten by chipmunks. <laughs> and <laughs> such a person, such a person should not go into wildlife conservation. And when I got to high school, I was, um, uh, well, my mother also intervened with the Philadelphia Public Library, and, and at age 11, I was able to get, as a result of her pressure, was able to get an uh, adult library card, and I used to read books about science and mathematics, and I was particularly fascinated by books about computers, and this was like 10 years after the very first computers, and this was the very first wave of books about computers, so I was reading about them as a high school student. Um, before I had seen or used a computer. Um, and I got to high school, and I was in, interested in biology. And I was one of the few students who actually was interested in biology. There were some who were going to be doctors, but they didn't care about biology. Um, and so the biology teacher, um, uh, he had a little uh, lab where they tried to grow slime molds, and he let me um, hang out there. And then he did something that um, I think had a big effect on my life. He had, um, he was a guy named Sam, Sam Lipow. Uh, this is at Central High School in Philadelphia, which was this academically selected, selective public high school. And he, um, he had a connection with the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, and he had been sending students there for about 10 years. Uh, every few years, he would send a student to to do the summer there. The first student he sent was a, a guy named Howard Temin. Uh, and that's where, you'll see Howard's name come up again. Um, and that's where um, Howard Temin met David Baltimore. Of course, this is like a decade before me, so I, I didn't know him at all. And another guy that was sent there from there is this, I, I keep forgetting his name. He's a virologist, a Barry, it's Bloom or something like that? Barry Bloom? Yeah. Barry um, Bloom. Yeah. He's now Dean of Public Health at Harvard. Okay, Dean of Public <laughs> Health at Harvard. I learned later by talking to him that he had also been a Sam Lipow protege sent to uh, the Jackson Lab. Um, and so in 1959, when I was 17, I got to go uh, for a summer in Bar Harbor, and we got these lectures in genetics. And that was the first genetics I had really learned. And it was early enough that they were always starting each lecture by telling you about DNA, because the DN structure of DNA had only been worked out um, five, you know, six years before. And so they would always start out and say, well, we know the genes are DNA. You do know about DNA, don't you? See, there are these four bases. And they would give you the DNA lecture. But I learned a fair amount of genetics there. Um, and they allowed me to come back the next summer, which was the summer between uh, high school and college. And um, 
The second summer I did a project in crossing mice. It was quantitative genetics. It was, it was crossing mice and um, I had to measure the weights of the baby mice and do a very elaborate analysis of variance um, after that. And I had to teach myself a lot of statistics. And the, um, my advisor there was a, a guy named John Fuller who um, was a behavioral geneticist. And he loaned me the new book that was just out, which was um, Quantitative Genetics by Douglas Falconer. Um, and I sort of had to read it and learn population genetics from it as I, as I went. Um, and it was actually a wonderful, a wonderful book to learn from. So that, that's my first exposure to population genetics. And it was actually before I got to college. And then came time to go to college. And um, I had an even choice between University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I'd, I'd heard that the University of Wisconsin was good in biology, so I, um, I applied there on the basis of just that rumor, um, and I got an even choice between them financially, so Wisconsin was 800 miles further from my parents, so that decided it, and I went to Wisconsin. Um, and once I got there, I was in a, a um, an honor seminar, and I met James F. Crow, Jim Crow, who came to speak to the seminar. And I showed him my report that I had written with the analysis of variance in it. Um, and he said, "Well, why don't you come and um, um, hang out in my laboratory when you when you want?" Um, and that was that was great. Um, I was also working had a um, a student job uh, working in the mouse room of a, a very wonderful um, uh, developmental biologist named Robert Auerbach. And um, he was a great guy. And uh, this job was essential in keeping me in school, basically. But I would go to Jim's lab and hang out and talk to. There were people there like Moto Kimura, who was a, had been a student of Jim's, but had come back for a visit during that time, uh, and many other people in that lab. And sometimes I would also talk to the uh, Drosophilist who had the next lab over, uh, who was a young guy named uh, Larry Sandler. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, so I, I think that may have something to do with my having been hired here. I don't know, but um, I, I, I can't ask Larry now. Um, so I started getting involved in that. I took, um, Jim said to me, uh, well, you've had enough genetics. Um, uh, so don't take elementary genetics. Take Larry Sandler's advanced genetics course. So I did, which was a great course. Um, Larry used to say that he was um, uh, a terrible teacher the first time he taught. But I've discovered that that was the first time he taught. And I can tell you he was a great teacher. Um, so I had that. And then I had Jim Crow's uh, theoretical population genetics course. Uh, and I also started writing computer programs. I took a computer programming course, and I started writing little genetic simulation uh, programs. And I think all of that started to get me into both theory and into population genetics. And with that long answer, <laughs> well, that oh, I, wanted, I want to tell one more story. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I also got to meet a great many people, and one uh, one of the early years that I was at Wisconsin, I was invited to a, um, uh, a Thanksgiving dinner at the house of a faculty member. And um, the, the Crows were there. The Kimuras were there. It was a whole bunch of, of uh, people. And the big, the big ta thing they were talking about was that Jim Crow's um, research associate, um, Rayla Greenberg, was going to come over later with her new boyfriend. And um, so uh, we had the meal, and afterwards uh, Rayla showed up with her new boyfriend, a young virologist, and they chatted nicely with us, and everybody said, oh, he's a nice guy. And Rayla and her, her boyfriend, who she later married, went away. And um, then everybody said, well, you know, he's a nice guy, but he has this one crazy idea. Uh, he thinks RNA can make, you know, can make DNA. Um, and everybody laughed and said, what a ridiculous you know, idea. Isn't that stupid? Uh, and this was Howard Temin. And you know, 20 years later, he had the Nobel Prize for that. Um, so it was a, a good object lesson. And the reason I want to mention it particularly is because 
the couple whose house the um, Thanksgiving dinner in were in fact um, uh, Larry and Iris Sandler. And Iris is here today, so <laughs> it sort of rounds off that, uh, that story. I don't know if you remember everybody <laughs> laughing at that Howard Temin had this stupid idea. <laughs> So uh, a while back, I was really surprised in, the, in a lab meeting where I was bringing up something to do with some mouse data I'd been looking at. And he said, oh, yes, when I was dissecting mice, we would observe such and such. And I, I, I was flabbergasted because I've never seen you look at a piece of real data in the entire time I've been here. So <laughs> when – no, it's true. I'm, I'm not kidding you. And, and when did you decide that was what you were going to do? And how did you decide that's what you were going to do? Well, I mean, the dissecting of mice was because I was at Jackson Laboratory for three summers, and they made you dissect a lot of <laughs> mice. And I, I still remember how to handle mice. Um, I think it was both the attraction of the math and the computers on the one side and my incompetence with the data. that I, I, At one point, I did a little cross in Jim Crow's lab of Drosophila strains to and do a statistical estimation of how many genes, how many loci were involved in a difference in wing length. And the answer came out to be 0 0.5, which was, you know, depressing. And so I think that's the result. I decided that I wasn't very good at that. Something that's happened within the lab is that you occasionally make bets with other people in the lab. And you told me at one point that you developed that habit from one of your mentors making bets with you. Can you tell that story? I, I could, but I don't remember it that way. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what I, when I, um, after I had been at the University of Wisconsin um, and been exposed to Jim Crow's lab, um, Jim was gingerly asking me whether uh, maybe I would want to be a graduate student with him. And I said, well, I think I've had a big influence from you, but I'd like to try to get some other influence. And he was actually very good about that. And he arranged me to go for a summer in 1963 to work with uh, Richard Lewinton as a computer programmer for the summer, in the who was then in the University of Rochester. And Dick said, uh, would you be interested in working with me as a graduate student? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'm moving to the University of Chicago, so apply there. And I did. And in Dick's lab at the University of Chicago, where I was from 64 to 67, um, he was in a – it was a stage of his career when he was very um, uh, argumentative and trying to be an English-style eccentric intellectual. And, uh, and it, 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 was a f it was putting on a show in a way, but it was fun. And uh, so we would have these arguments over um, trivialities. And um, at one point, I had some argument with him about um, how to analyze a certain kind of data with a chi-square. And he said this, and I said that. And then I went, I went back to my uh, dorm room. And the next day, I came into his lab, and I found a, a sheet of paper on my desk that said, you were right, I was wrong in his handwriting. And I immediately picked it up and went, marched into his <laughs> office and laid it in front of him. And he immediately knew what I wanted and pulled out a pen and signed <laughs> a piece of paper. <laughs> so um, I still have it somewhere. Um, I have no idea what the question was we were arguing about. Um, but I think that led me to have this system of betting people 25 cents and it's just a way of it's, – it's a sort of juvenile way of reminding them that they were wrong. Um, <laughs> and one of our postdocs, the most recent postdoc uh, who left the lab, left behind a little sort of wooden plaque with a quarter in the middle of it. And that this was a quarter he had won off of me. So, so I, it didn't come from any particular uh, other person. I've been here 21 years, and I'm up – 50 cents, and I remember both episodes extremely vividly, <laughs> so it works for me. That's the purpose of <laughs> <laughs> That was actually a turning point for me as a scientist, is 1993, walking into your lab and saying, you were wrong in your last paper, and you started waving this quarter at me and saying, you're going to have to prove it. <laughs> it, was, it was a powerful experience. Uh, so how, so we've, we've seen you, you know, in various places on the East Coast. How did you end up here at the University of Washington, and when? 
Well, I, first of all, Wisconsin and Chicago are not really on the East Coast. <laughs> um, that's, I know you grew up in Alaska and Seattle, and everyone in Alaska and Seattle thinks that everything east of Denver is the East Coast. But, uh, that's quite true. People out in Philadelphia used to think that Wisconsin was the Wild West. And, uh, that was there. So, um, well, after. After I had been at the University of Wisconsin, uh, University of Chicago for um, several years, um, we'll, we'll get back to the what I was doing there. Um, the um, uh, it was time to apply for jobs, and I had a an NIH. Um, I'd applied to NIH for a postdoc to work in Scotland on quantitative genetics, and was able to get that, which was hard to get to get NIH money to go overseas. So I had to apply for jobs before I went to um, on that postdoc because in those days you either went straight from a PhD into a job or you might take one year of postdoc but the idea of taking more than one year of postdoc was completely unheard of. Mm. Nobody ever did that in those days. So I went around and uh, I think a numbers of departments wrote to Dick Lewinton in those years and said, do you have anybody graduating in your lab? Because Dick had just done the work with uh, the Lewinton and Hubby work where they had uh, surveyed electrophoretic variability and discovered that there was a very high amount of uh, heterozygosity and high amount of polymorphism um, in electrophoretic loci. And suddenly, in population genetics, where there had been almost no data and no data at the gene level before, um, suddenly there was this vast amount of data and it became an exciting area. So I think it was very saleable by being from Dick's lab in spite of the fact that I, they had never uh, run a gel uh, and knew nothing about uh, um, those, those experiments. And I went around to four different places and gave um, job interviews uh, talking actually about my evolutionary tree stuff. Um, and I basically got four offers. And of course, people may not remember this late, the mid to late 60s when the universities were all expanding very rapidly. Um, and the, um, it was very easy to get a job and it was very easy to get hired, you know, off. Places were always hiring people off each other and everybody was moving from one place to another every few years. Um, so I, I, I got offers. I came out here and job interviewed, and um, this was a very attractive department because it was very strong in molecular genetics. But I think the thing that sealed it is that uh, they gave me, a, there was a reception for me, um, and it was in Arno Matulski's earlier house in Laurelhurst. And they took me out on the porch on a beautiful May day, and there was a 100 miles of the Cascades showing. Um, and um, the result was that I came to the uh, <laughs> University of Washington. So uh, I, I was just on the job market. And, and it, when I applied, I, um, I knew and they knew that I would go off for a year in postdoc and then, and then show up at the end of that. So, so were you planning to stay in Seattle or were you expecting that like everyone else you'd shuffle around from institute to institute? I don't know that I had thought about it at all. I think I started assuming I'd be there forever, and then everybody else started getting hired away. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I liked Seattle, so uh, I stayed. So what were you working on when you first came to UW? What kinds of problems? Um, well, I was working on theoretical population genetics, and that had been the work I started doing with, I started doing work on that with Dick Lewinton. I had a very grandiose uh, thesis um, project, uh, a sort of macroevolution model, which was my idea, not his. And it, it didn't work. I mean, I had no usable results. So during my, we're, we're sort of, I'll have to let you, you'll have to let me rewind back into graduate school. So in, 1964, 1965, just after I got to graduate school, down the hall from Dick's lab was uh, the labs of Jack Hubby, who he was starting to work with on the electrophoresis project. And just beyond that, the lab of um, a guy named Lynn Throckmorton, 
who was sort of the world's expert on Drosophila systematics. And I think people working on multiple species of Drosophila will still say, oh yes, Throckmorton, everybody cites his papers on this. And he, he was a funny guy, a kind of stuffy guy, but, but very forward looking. And so he and Jack Hubby had a, some data sets that were total protein electrophoresis. So they were bands where there was a locus that produced a large amount of protein. And they, they had done them on multiple species. And they had these patterns of presence, presences and absence of, of bands. And they wanted to do a clustering of some sort based on that to get some idea of the evolutionary tree. And so they brought me a book, which I have a copy of here, another book. And that's um, Sokol and Sneet's numerical taxonomy, which had just come out um, a year or two before. And this book was a sort of pioneer book in putting forward clustering algorithms, this, the same ones that are being used in gene expression array heat maps now. The, the little trees you see along the sides are, are the methods that they were putting forward in the 60s. I think the gene expression people think that they reinvented, they invented them, they don't realize that they're all, they're all in here. And so they say, can you do this for us? Can you make, make us a computer program to uh, do that? So I sat down, I wrote a program, I got a tree, I came in, I showed it to them, and I said, is this reasonable? And they said, no. Um, I went away, I found a bug in the program. Uh, I ran it again. Now, of course, in those days, that took several days. Each, you, you got one run per day. Um, and I came back to them and I said, is this reasonable? And they said, no. And this kept on going on and on. I kept finding bugs one after another. And, um, and finally, I came by and said, is this reasonable? And they said, oh yeah. Uh, and they were, by that time, they were totally uninterested. <laughs> you know, I had, I'd, I'd, I'd really worn out my welcome. And they never used it. They never did anything with it. But I was hooked. I was fascinated by this. So during my graduate years at the University of Chicago, I was working on these population genetic models officially, but I was also doing evolutionary tree um, algorithms, uh, computer programs. I was going down to the Field Museum, um, at the, at, uh, which was affiliated with the University of Chicago, and talking to people uh, in the amphibians and reptiles section and about what is your data like and how can I do this. And Robert Sokol, who was the author of this book, passed through and he was starting to talk about parsimony methods. Uh, he had tried to analyze them. He actually didn't like them and wanted to show they wouldn't work. But in order to do that, he had to figure out how to do them. Um, and that's, those are methods where you minimize the number of steps, the number of changes in, a, in the characters to estimate the tree. So I wrote a program, after he gave a lecture on that, I wrote a program to do that. And I got very hooked on those things. And so in my early years here at the University of Washington, I was doing theoretical population genetics on things like geographic variation, and evolution of recombination um, for really the first decade that I was here. But during that time, I was continuing to work on phylogenies, and I would publish an occasional paper. Um, and by the end of the 1970s, um, that area was heating up. And I had an interest in um, sort of evolution a little bit beyond the species level. And um, I began to see that this interest in the evolutionary trees was fit in with the interest, uh, with the, the phylogeny algorithm stuff that I was doing. And I started to shift my work away from theoretical population genetics. And I think that people in this department were not much aware of that. And they just, after a while, when I was working entirely on, um, on evolutionary trees, on phylogenies, um, they began to see that it was some way that I had gone wrong. Um, this guy was you know, a bright theoretical population geneticist, but he doesn't seem to be doing any population genetics anymore. He has this hobby called trees. And um, it, I think it sort of, I sort of developed into this 
dual reality where I would teach courses in theoretical population genetics, but I was really working on something that wasn't even genetics. And I think that, that it meant there was a sort of lack of communication about that with my colleagues. Once again, I've talked too much and I no. forgot what your question was. <laughs> you answered it by all means. Okay. So you said that at that point the field was starting to heat up and I know that it went through a period where there was a tremendous amount of excess heat and a lot of polarization, yeah. uh, a lot of very surprisingly combative interactions among researchers. How do you think that happened? How did that develop? Yeah. That's a whole history which I think people in this department don't know anything about. I mean, they, they didn't experience it. but. Um, I got, I was doing more and more papers on a statistical approach to inferring evolutionary trees. And at the same time, the parsimony methods were very popular. Um, and a lot of systematists had come to the conclusion that minimizing the number of events was correct for a philosophical reason. Um, not for any statistical reason. In fact, they rejected thinking about it statistically. So they, they would say, um, you want, you know, William of Ockham had put forward met the principle of parsimony and they would connect it to um, Karl Popper and hypothetical deductive methods and they would have all of these philosophical frameworks coming down to you got to minimize this one quantity and it has philosophical priority over everything else. And these numerical methods were getting, making inroads among morphological systematists, people working on, on uh, measurements of bones and uh, discrete characters, not on, not on molecular sequences. And they were, they wanted to think about it philosophically. They wanted to derive straight from William of Ockham their particular methods. If somebody came along and said, you got to do statistics, uh, they were not happy. Um, so that was one large group of people who were using these algorithms. Another large group of people was um, molecular evolutionists. And the field of molecular evolution had arisen in the 60s with the availability of sequence, mostly protein sequence data. And there they just wanted to use any algorithm they could get their hands on. They're very eclectic and very uh, pragmatic. So you had those two groups of people, but the morphological systematists really um, started getting very um, evangelical and very messianic about this. And, and part of the reason was they were competing with the more traditional systematists who were taking their cue from uh, Ernst Meyer and George Gaylord Simpson. And all the big museum positions were all held by the traditional systematists. And here came these young Turks along with these computers and said, we've got this new method. It's, it's by definition better. Uh, your methods don't make any sense. And they, they, I think they were under pressure to raise the temperature of the debate to try to dislodge these um, old guys from the museum positions. And so there was this huge conflict and I think that it's selected for people who liked conflict. And so people started coming into that field. Oh boy, I get to call people names. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> um, and the statistical stuff I was doing and some other people I knew was outside of that consensus. And so we felt the heat also. They were, they were busy telling us that go away, we don't want those methods are wrong by definition. And there was this, this huge, really, war over uh, evolutionary tree methods in the 1980s. And it really started about 1978 or 9, and it went on for about a decade. And it was really, really bitter. Um, when I was in theoretical population genetics, we used to, um, people would fight about neutrality versus selection, and we thought we were very contentious. And when I got into this area, I just discovered we hadn't a clue, these people. I mean, <laughs> uh, they came within inches of throwing chairs at each other. I mean, they, they would torpedo the, the job applications of their, of their competitors and openly justify it. They wouldn't do it secretly. They'd say, those guys aren't doing science. We got to drive them out of the field. And they were very open about that. 
and and there's really just this uh, this horrible <laughs> atmosphere, and I, and I had to find ways of persisting, but I was able to do that because I had funding from the U.S. Department of Energy or the Atomic Energy Commission, which became ultimately the U.S. Department of Energy, to work on mutations in populations. And the nice thing about DOE funding was it was almost, it never went up, but it was al almost automatically renewed. And uh, that gave me a base that I could work from while I was really doing evolutionary tree stuff. So. Um, it was it was a, a decade of, of really really bad conflict, and uh, at one point I had to send a paper to a journal in England because no American journal was going to treat it fairly. <laughs> I mean, it was things like that. So uh, I don't know. What do you want me to tell you about? You know, the I, the story that you told that sticks with me is of people literally sitting on the opposite sides of the room during talks and booing each other's speakers, which. Yeah. I saw just the very tail end of in the 80s, and I was amazed, but apparently it had been much worse. So you, you saw some of it, so you can believe that this might <laughs> even be true. I mean, yeah, there was a meeting, a numerical taxonomy meeting. Bob Sokol had had numerical taxonomy meetings mostly about centered around his clustering methods. And these people started coming, these cladists, uh, phylogenetic systematists who were also called cladists, started coming to that meeting. And in it came to a head in 1979 in a meeting at Harvard, um, and there was this room with about 100 people in it, and one camp was sitting on the right side, and the other camp was sitting on the left side, and if a speaker from one camp spoke, his people all said, oh, yeah, oh, yes, clap, you know, and the other side went, rrr, rrr, grumble, grumble. Um, and there was this incredible tension, you know, and, and each side tried to get the other one's speakers, and, drive them out of the field. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's hard to even um, persuade anybody that this was true, that, that, that things like this happened. I don't, I haven't, except over issues of nature and nurture where it gets very political, I have not seen this in genetics. But but sounds like you saw. I saw, well, in yeah. 1991 at the first uh, workshop on molecular evolution that I attended, they had yeah one speaker from the cladistic or mm -hmm. systematist camp in a in a workshop that has otherwise pretty much gone over to thinking of phylogenetics as a statistical inference problem and that made the polarization very clear in terms of the the dramatic difference between how, I don't remember who it was I'm sorry to say but the dramatic difference between how she was approaching and how everyone else was and also the degree of defensiveness and aggressiveness and it was an eye-opener. I, I had not expected that. I thought, well, this is a person with different views, but I had not expected to see this, the remnants still in 91 of this, this feud. Well, 10 years earlier in the Harvard meeting, just multiply that by 10, you know, and you, and you get a meeting that you had, to, you had to crank yourself up for like six months just to get yourself able to go to this meeting. And so do you think that, w that is, is the field still like that and has just simmered down, or is one view overtaken the other? What's what's the situation nowadays? It's it's funny. It's subsided, but it hasn't completely gone away. Um, what happened was I was working on developing statistical methods, maximum likelihood, bootstraps, uh, and other things in the 1980s. Um, and there was this horrible uh, um, you know, conflict going on over the cladistic view versus everybody else. But in the late 1980s, as more statistical methods became available, um, and also as the cladists who were quite, I'm trying not to say the word crazy, uh, <laughs> they were you know, very evangelical and messianic and, um, and fierce, and they didn't seem to understand that there should be any limits on how nasty you could be to anyone. Um, and they started actually to alienate some of their own followers. Um, you know, there were people coming in who were persuaded by their views and they would go to their meetings and then they would find this horrible atmosphere. Um, and they would start to back away from their own um, allies. And so at the end of the 1980s, there was a move by some of the better young uh, phylogenetic systematists to find 
a way to have meetings other than the one, the Claytis meeting. The Claytis meetings were what is still called the, the Willy Hennig Society after uh, their predecessor, Willy Hennig, um, who had died in the meantime and was not really part of this. They had their own meetings. I was not welcome at those meetings. I never, never would go to those meetings. And um, some of their own people started saying, this is terrible, we can't function like this. And they started, they took over the Society of Systematic Zoology. Uh, they changed its name to the Society of Systematic Biology. And they moved its meeting time to be with the Evolution Society and the American Society of Naturalists, um, which is a, a summer, an early summer meeting. And basically to create a place they could talk about this stuff without being crazy. Um, and that sapped away a certain number of people, of younger people from, from their group. And at the same time, the statistical methods were becoming uh, available and some of molecular evolutionists who had never bought into the whole, uh, to all the, the real conflict, uh, started using the statistical methods um, and even started um, insisting that papers in their journals have some statistical analyses. And so by the end of the 1980s, and just the period when you, you sort of see the last bit of the conflict, um, basically what happened is the newer generations of people coming into the field started behaving much more normally um, and accepting statistical views. But there still is the Willy Hennig Society and those still same people are still there and they meet and uh, they still have this evangelical and messianic uh, uh, approach to things. And it's kind of like they, instead of gradually conceding while pretending they weren't conceding, which is the standard scientific thing to do, um, they kind of went up on a mountaintop and said, we're gonna hold out here until relief arrives. Um, and they're still there. You know, they're still having their meetings. I, I can't resist telling a story yeah. here, which is that I was invited to speak in Columbus, Ohio, and I was taken out to meet many of the faculty, and at one point they drove me several miles from the university and dropped me off at the Vertebrate Museum with two of the people you described who said, oh goodness, Joe Felsenstein's protege. <laughs> and we had a very awkward five minutes, and then I said, have you seen what they're doing with phylogenies in linguistics? Isn't that cockeyed? And they said, yes, we think it's terrible, don't you? And we talked about linguistics for the remainder of the afternoon, and it was great. <laughs> because we both hated what was being done with phylogenetics and linguistics at the time. But it was, it was an awkward moment, and you could see that. Well, you could see that they had, I mean, it was not a matter of, oh, yes, we disagree, isn't that? It's too bad we disagree, we think you're wrong, but let's have a pleasant conversation. That's not their approach. I mean, their approach is, you believe this other thing, you're evil. <laughs> you know? During almost all your time at UW, you have been the population geneticist and evolutionary biologist and certainly phylogeneticist in the department. And what has that been like? That's, that's a very different experience than what many of us have. Yeah, it's, it's a different, um, yeah, I think it was partly the, the population geneticist because when in any other department thought about hiring a theoretician, they would say, oh, we got one. You know, we, population <laughs> genetics, yeah, we got one. He's over in the genetics department. Um, so it served as a sort of excuse for everybody else not to hire anyone in the area. Um, what I basically found was the work I was doing on phylogenies uh, was not understood by my colleagues. That it, you know, I was an evolutionary biologist, a population biologist. I was not uh, a, a molecular biologist or a cell biologist. I still like to point out that I don't know the names of all 20 amino acids. Um, and it became very clear early on that even with respect to population genetics, which was at least genetics, that if I invited other theoreticians to come and give seminars, that this didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, they would come, the audience would sort of show up with a chip on its shoulder saying, why do we have to listen to this stuff? Um, and, and often the po theoretical population geneticists would not do a very good job of communicating to anybody why they should be interested. So after a while, I just um, stopped inviting um, 
population genetic theoreticians to come give seminars. Um, and I never got into inviting phylogeny people to give seminars because there was the department over there, here where I was. My work I was mostly um, doing by talking to people at other universities, going to meetings, um, communicating with people, distributing computer programs. And so it was kind of walled off from what the department was doing. So I wish I could say ways in which my interactions with my colleagues may had big effects on my work, but mostly there weren't those kinds of interactions. I mean, I, I had good relationships with people in the department, but uh, I don't think my work ever really in, had any interface with the department. I got, I think I got my first, the, I have my file package of computer programs has been distributed since 1980 and it's now got 30,000 registered registrations. The first registration from my own department was not until I think around 1991. So for the first 11 years, nobody in the department even used it. And some guy called me from the biochemistry department about that and said, I was talking to my friend in Florida on the phone about how do I get one of these evolutionary tree computer programs and he told me about you. I didn't know you were down there. Um, and so it was kind of like in the 90s, people started discovering that maybe this stuff was, was actual, maybe it wasn't just my hobby, you know, basically. <laughs> so has that really changed uh, since around the formation of genome sciences? What's it like now? Oh, it, it's very different because um, people have discovered that uh, phylogenies are important and they're, they're sort of the, the central structure if you want to look at the evolution of really anything, characters, uh, sequences, characters uh, between species. You, you have to think in terms of phylogenies. Um, they've also discovered that evolution really is relevant to genomics. Um, and there started to be in the 1990s um, discussion of computational biology. And I always felt that the important thing wasn't that you're using a computer, it was that you're thinking evolutionarily or you're thinking statistically, but everyone seemed to want to focus on it. It's this thing you do with computers, so we'll call it computational biology. And I remember a couple times when, um, one was when David Botstein came through and gave a talk, and another time was when um, Lee Hood came just as he was uh, being recruited to the University of Washington. And they both got up and gave a talk saying, people have to know how to use computers with biology. It's important. And I, I exaggerate only a little when I say my colleagues stood up on their chairs and cheered. And I remember looking at them and thinking, are these the same people I've been <laughs> discussing curriculum with? Are these the same people? You know, they, they suddenly seem to have changed. Um, and so there has been this greater appreciation. And now you go to journal clubs and a good fraction of them are in one way or another about evolution, but uh, you know, back in you know, like 1980 or so, that certainly wasn't the case. Um, they, they, it was it was a subject that was sort of off the radar screen. So I think it's I think it's changed a lot, um, and now we have. Well, lately there's the area of um, so-called population genomics, which. Um, is busy rediscovering all the things that population geneticists used to know and, and imagining that they're new. But uh, again, I exaggerate slightly, but only slightly. So I recall that when we moved, at least at that time, I haven't seen it recently, but you still have the department's, uh, the genetics department's first computer? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, my, the, Can the, you uh, say something about the trajectory from that wooden, I kid you not, wooden object to where we are today? <laughs> It didn't work by little pieces of wood, you know, <laughs> hitting each other. Um, yeah, in, in I was, you know, always doing things with computers, usually with mainframes and time-sharing systems. And in the late 1970s, microcomputers started becoming available. And I have a brother, Lee, who was a, a microcomputer engineer in California who was heavily involved in the early years of microcomputers. And he designed two of the early popular systems. 
One was a thing in 1976 called the, uh, the SOL-20, the Processor Technology SOL-20. Uh, the other, several years later, was called the Osborne One. For some of you may remember Osborne Computers, and that was his design. Well, if you have a brother who designs a microcomputer and you yourself are thinking about buying a microcomputer, you have to buy his <laughs> microcomputer. There really is no choice. So I have my old SOL-20. Uh, which I bought in, 19, in my lab in 1977. Uh, still upstairs. Um, it may work or may not. Uh, it, it was the first desktop computer in the, in the uh, genetics department. And uh, maybe I can recondition it sometime and get it working. But it, it of course, is glacial compared to t today's machines. But I still, I still do have it. No, it had uh, it originally 48K of memory, and then it was upgraded to 64K. And it had an um, instruction cycle of about, um, uh, it's about one megahertz machine. Now we have, what is it? What's, a, what's a state of the art is what, three gigahertz or something like that? That's uh, 3,000 times faster? Am I off by 1,000? So, you know, you run one of those machines, it's, it's really, really slow. If you make it do a lot of square roots, you can see that it can do maybe seven square roots a second or something like that. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not, not very fast. And often people will come to me today and say, well, why back in those days, why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? And I have to keep saying, do you understand the machines we were working with? You, you know, or they'll say, why didn't you write all this stuff out onto disk? And I'll say, because we didn't have any disk. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that thing ran on seven-inch floppies. I'd never seen a seven-inch floppy. Eight-inch, eight inch? yeah. I should have brought one down They're there. funny. They're, they're this big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Floppy disk. Holds 244K of, um, of The other contrast I'd bring bytes. up, though, is that when I came to the lab in 91, and for quite a few years thereafter in the old Department of Genetics, uh, as far as I could tell, your lab was running computing in genetics, and that oh, if yeah. anything went wrong, someone would call you and you would They'd come They'd call me. I would be sitting there working on a paper, and somebody would call me up and say, my keyboard stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> and the only way of maintaining good relations with my colleagues was to go fix the keyboard. <laughs> and say, you know, the connector fell off the back of your computer <laughs> to try putting it back in. John Gallant called us one day and said, all of my email has been forwarded to France. <laughs> <laughs> and then and called us back a few hours later and said, well, you said you fixed the problem, but the email has not come back. <laughs> <laughs> I fortunately had forgotten that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. We... we you know, and it, it's astonishing to me now when I look at the work these guys do that we could do. But it tells you the way that computing in the department has just gone up explosively because we can never do that now. Yeah, I, I've been amazed at the amount of computing that's, that's being done. I mean, the fact that we have a cluster system with a thousand uh, processors is, astonishes me. And for a while I thought, oh, isn't it nice of them to do this for us? And then I realized finally that it wasn't being done for us. It was being done to catch all this high throughput sequencing data. And if our lab got access to the cluster, that was a side effect. You know, it was not, it was not really there for, uh, for what we were doing. I do find it funny, though, that you said much earlier, well, these were very early computers. And you should realize it took several days to get out of phylogeny. And now we've got this incredibly sophisticated computer thing. And now sometimes it takes several weeks to get out of phylogeny. <laughs> that's because the, that's because the heating, the, the power keeps failing. But well, that too. I do like to point out, I mean, there, there are statistics. Our, our lab, I calculated for a while, the computing power available to us was going up by 85% per year geometrically for a long time. May still be. I don't know. Um, if you project back, you begin to see how little we had. And when I learned to um, program in the early 1960s at the University of Wisconsin, it was on a machine that could do about 100,000 operations per second um, and had a memory of something like um, 32 
thousand uh, bytes, roughly, or thirty to thousand. Maybe it was a little more than that because I think they were words, um, and had no disk. And people will say, "Well, how fast was that machine?" And so I went back and tried to figure out what do we have today that is that speed. And I thought, well, maybe a cell phone. No, cell phone is far faster. Um, maybe a, um, a wristwatch, uh, you know, a, a, a little hand calculator, a wristwatch, they're, they're faster. And I finally did discover that the speed of the computer available to me in 1961 when I took my programming course was about the same as the processor in a singing birthday card. <laughs> you know, that, that when you get, when you open the singing birthday card and it sings happy birthday to you, that is the mainframe at the <laughs> University of Wisconsin in 1961, this room full of large boxes. Um, that's, uh, it, has, it has less memory than, than the Wisconsin machine did, but uh, it's the same speed. So. <laughs> wow. So one thing that you've had to face in your career that most of your colleagues probably haven't is that you're working in a field where, by some measures, 50% of Americans are not sure that the thing you're studying exists. Yeah. What impact has that had on, on your career? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it has an indirect impact because the granting agencies are funding work on evolution, but often they have not wanted to use the word evolution because they know there are reactionary powerful congressmen uh, who might decide in a stroke of the pen to eliminate funding for evolution at the federal level. Um, and so they've been very timid about that. In 19, around 1990, I was on a committee that went to um, NSF headquarters in Washington, D.C. and um, wrote a document over a weekend that said basically it's, we scientists agree that it's okay if NSF uses the word evolution um, instead of just talking about population genetics and genetic change. Yes, it's okay for you to word, use the word evolution. Uh, I do remember at that time the one of the higher ups in NSF came to our, um, uh, our meeting and said, you know, in the annual congressional budget hearings, we at NSF, our time allotment in the annual congressional budget hearings is three minutes. And that three minutes is for everything NSF does, not evolution. I mean, that's for studying astronomy and, you know, everything that they do. Of course, NIH gets, gets more because they're much better funded. Um, but so it's had this sort of tenuous existence, and I think like a lot of basic research, a lot of it gets smuggled in under the pretense that it's applied research. Um, and it's, it's really sad that, you know, that they've had to do that. Um, I haven't gotten involved in the whole creationism thing until the late 1990s when I started. I was, I was on some, a, molecular biology and evolution forum, uh, internet forum, and I was serving as an expert, and along came some creationists, and some of them I had to engage in long-running uh, debates for months at a time uh, on this bulletin board, but it was a big education. And when the, um, when the, when the famous uh, uh, court case in Dover, Pennsylvania occurred in 2005, I believe it was, after that, a lot of people here at the University of Washington started getting more active um, in fighting creationism because they began to get embarrassed by the fact that the Discovery Institute, which is the main players on the other side, were here in town. Um, and um, they, people started saying, well, we're going to be accused of having done nothing about this, so we better get off our butts and, and start trying to get at these people. So there's been more activism here in the aftermath of Dover, and I've gotten, I've gotten involved in that. And I'm busy writing things for various internet, internet forums. Um, but most of the time I was here, like, like all of my fellow evolutionary biologists, I basically put my head down and said, those people will go away if we ignore them. There, there was a time in the early 80s um, 
when Monty Slatkin, another theoretician, a very fine theoretician, was here in the Department of Biology, that um, a guy named Dwayne Gish came to town. Now, Dwayne Gish was like one of the original creationist debaters. And he would go around campuses and give talks about how, I think one of his books was called Evolution, the Fossils Say No. Uh, and it was all about, we look back in the fossil record and we don't see gradual change, we just see things that look exactly like what we have today. Uh, that was his line. Most evolutionary biologists were working at the within population level and didn't know how to refute any of this. The few of them that would go up against Duane Gish, who was a very, he was a very effective debater, would get killed because he would say, okay, what does this fossil look like? And they wouldn't know. Uh, we were training evolutionary biologists who actually did not know how to debate with creationists. And he came through and um, the word came out in advance to Monty and I that he wanted to debate the two of us. And we were smart enough to say no because we would have had to drop everything we were doing, spend three to six months preparing, reading everything he ever said, educating ourselves about fossils, distilling it down to be able to nail him in 20 minutes. And his technique was what's called the Gish Gallop, uh, which is <coughs> you go racing through evolution, evolutionary biology, making assertions about what the data says, leaving sort of con um, perceptual, you know, conceptual wreckage behind you. And the other person debating can't possibly straighten out the mess in that time. And the result is that, that Gish wins the debate. Uh, and he, he would go around flattening evolutionary biologists after evolutionary biologists, many of whom said, oh, well, he's completely wrong. He's an idiot. I know this stuff. And they'd go in there and they'd just get killed. Um, and so we at least were smart enough in the early 80s not to debate him. Um, a guy named Eugene Hun, a um, uh, eth uh, ethnoanthropologist, he was an anthropologist working on um, what um, various uh, societies did about um, classifying animals and plants in the wild. He went up and tried to do the best he could against, against Gish. But um, we were the designated uh, sacrificial lambs and, and we fortunately didn't do it. So we sat in the audience and listened. But I think most of my um, fighting of creationism is, is very recent and, and I have to say I was like everybody else, just putting my head down and saying, well, these people will go away if we ignore them, and they won't. So. I found out about this quite by, by, about some of this by accident because I was reading an argument about the second law of thermodynamics, and I was yeah. like, this is really well written, but it also sounds strangely familiar. And then I got down to the bottom and found your name on it, and it's like, oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, these the, the weeds yeah. in the garden analogy. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, there's a guy, there's a a um, applied mathematician at uh, University of Texas, El Paso, named Granville Sewell. Uh, and he goes around putting out writing papers and trying to get them into mathematical journals, arguing that the second law of thermodynamics proves that evolution can't happen. And that's an old, hoary creationist myth. And, um, he has some new angles of new equations on it, but uh, basically it's the same argument. And so um, various people have written responses to him, and I wrote one in which I said, look, among the things you just proved is that plants can't grow uh, in, in your, you know, you ought to tell the gardeners because you've just proven that weeds can't grow in the garden. And you've also just proven that flowers can't grow. So maybe they shouldn't waste their time. But uh, yeah, that's what that, you know, that argument was about. What, where do you see your field going at this point? What's the, the stuff that's looming on the horizon for good or ill? Yeah. Well, I should say, first of all, that my field has been working on these phylogeny algorithms, but then about the time that Mary entered the lab, we got back into looking at coalescence, which are trees of genes within species that are formed as a result of genetic drift. Um, and Mary's work, Mary now has a large group working on programs to analyze that. Um, basically what's going on right now 
is that the two lines of work in one of them being molecular population genetics, which started with really with Dick Lewinton's work, um, and is people looking at genetic variation within species. That line of work was separated really in the 1960s from people working on molecular evolution. And people like Alan Wilson's lab at University of California, Berkeley, were not really using population genetic thinking at all, but they were looking between species at molecular data, and they're getting wonderful results, and they were a central lab in that. And there came to be these, these sort of two, you know, here I'm making an evolutionary tree, but I mean the two lines of work diverging with only an occasional connection between them. And what's happened in recent years is they're starting to come back together. And so there's a new, there's a phenomenon that I think is very important. I think it's, it's not a new evolutionary synthesis because it's not putting forward a new theory of evolution. It's using the same old theory of evolution. But now we can make observations both within and between populations and we can start to relate, find out what genes are responsible for differences between species. And so these, these levels of work, which were completely separate from each other for decades, uh, are starting to come together. So I like to call it uh, the reunion. It's like uh, family members who weren't talking to each other are now starting to talk to each other and have joint potlucks. Um, and you're starting to get a merging of evolutionary work between species with evolutionary work within species. I mean, you've just put in your Lamarck package of um, coalescent programs, um, a facility for tree, trees of populations with the phenomenon, the genetic drift phenomenon going on in within each of those, uh, say, species. Uh, so your, you know, the development of your package is really um, it's it's reflecting this this merger of of. Uh, of levels at which people can look at evolutionary biology. And of course, we're also in the era where very, very soon every bio biological sample that's collected, every organism in it will have its complete genome done. And that's that's happening faster than any of us could have could have <laughs> guessed. I mean, we're we're sort of having Mary will know about all about this, but we're having a debate in our laboratory essentially over the the so-called next generation sequencing which by the way is an appalling name it's the current generation of sequencing is called next generation of sequencing in one more generation the previous generation will be called next generation sequencing terrible terminology um, but one issue is should mary put into her package facilities for handling next gen sequencing and there's an argument to be made saying, no, don't do it. Because by the time you can get it working, it won't be there anymore. You'll be just receiving complete se completely sequenced and probably phased uh, sequences. Uh, maybe you should just get ready for those. Because there's a, there's a time lag in getting any of these features in. So we're all sort of going to be facing the issue of, well, what can you do with this data? Um, and, uh, I don't know. I, I think probably we will. There'll be some disappointments about how much power it has, but uh, we certainly have to have to get ready for it. I think the other thing that I, I, I've heard you say, and I've heard it from others as well, is that in the early days of population <coughs> genetics, you had a tremendous amount of theory out there in quest for very small amounts of available data. Yeah. And that in the last decade or two, the situation's completely reversed, and we're now drowning in this pipeline. We are, yeah. And I think. I mean, Dick Lewinton actually took me aside in 1964 when I started as his graduate student. And this is before there was electrophoretic data out there. And he said, have you considered the possibility that you're going into a dying field? Because we had all this wonderful theory for population, uh, for changes of genotype frequencies, and no data. Okay. Um, well, it partly shows that he didn't himself understand that his own work was going to supply that data. Um, and I stupidly said, oh, yeah, I've thought about it. It's okay. And I think back on it, and it, it wasn't okay. I mean, maybe the field really was going to die out. Now we're in the opposite situation, and, and it's kind of like there's all this data and not enough theory. 
um, and not enough theoreticians. Um, the number of people training in population genetics theory now is very, very small. Um, and everybody thinks that somebody else will develop methods. Um, and I think there's, a, there's actually a need to try to revive the training of theoreticians, um, it's which it's kind of been slowly dying out while the data, the amount of data is going up, and I think that's not a healthy situation. There, there can be an illusion that whatever problems we have with understanding could be solved by adding more data, sure. which for yeah. some problems may be true, but for many it's not. You simply end up with a very large pile of information that you cannot understand. Yeah, and I think there's also been a situation where the popularity of phylogeny algorithms has meant that students in evolutionary biology, for example, over in the biology department, which I'm a, a joint member of, students in that department are trained, and in departments like it nationwide, are being trained to run all these phylogeny programs, <laughs> uh, but not to understand the theory underlying population biology. So you have people coming out who know all about um, subtree pruning and regrafting rearrangement of trees, which is a technical um, trick used to search in tree space. But if you ask them and say, okay, tell me about population genetics, what's Volan's law? Uh, tell me about how a mutational load argument works. Um, they'll say mutational what? Volan who? Um, and they think of themselves as fully trained evolutionary biologists, but they're not. And I think we have the same situation in population genomics. People are going to just have vast amounts of data and just do, you know, pardon my language, but do completely half-assed things with it because they don't know any better. And, and I wish there was some way to persuading people that um, we need to train people in the development of the methods and the properties of the methods, and that means population genetics. So on a brighter note, if there's yeah. one piece of research that you are really aesthetically pleased by, something that was not just successful but was gorgeous, which one would it be? Uh, you know, I thought about that, and um, I'd have to say, I'll be cynical again, um, there was a method called the Bootstrap Monte Carlo method that I came up with for use of, with um, coalescence in the early 90s, and I thought it was just the cutest idea. Um, and it, was, it enabled a very fast analysis of um, uh, coalescent data. Um, and it really is one of the more elegant ideas I've ever had. The only problem was that it was wrong. So somebody pointed out to us that um, it didn't work, and we then found out why. Uh, I had made an assumption that something was a distrib statistical distribution, and it really wasn't. Um, so there's an example of something that was really you know, a beautiful, beautiful result, and um, unfortunately uh, didn't work. <laughs> so there's, there's also a paper I wrote in 1978 on a macroevolution model in which you had a loop of an evolving ecosystem in which you had energy flows into imaginary organisms and they had different rates of loss of energy. And you got a very nice answer out about that under some assumptions, this evolving ecosystem could grow in energy content so as to con contain within it at any moment a constant fraction of all the energy that ever came in. Um, I really thought of that as one of the most important things I've ever done. Um, and in the last 30 years, uh, it's 34 years ago, it got three citations. Um, most of them by literary theorists who admired its grandiosity but had no idea what it was. Uh, finally, Carl Bergstrom in the, bi in the biology department um, cited it in a paper recently, so it's had one citation, but um, I think that's one of the most beautiful things that I've ever done, and probably, <laughs> and I would, I'd go so far as to say that in the long run, it will possibly be, you know, if I look ahead 50 years and say somebody is reading one of my papers 50 years from now, which one is it? I'll say that one. But, you know, I'm talking about a paper that one person has cited in 34 years, so <laughs> one real scientist. What's the most cited paper? The most cited paper is my paper on the bootstrap method for phylogenies, which has something like 17,000 citations right now. 
and its citation numbers have grown. They're about at their peak now, and then they'll probably tail off on the other side and end up with about 35,000 citations. And I like to brag, that paper is the most cited scientific paper ever produced at the University of Washington. However, I am not the most cited scientist at the University of Washington. If you do all the web of science stuff, uh, it turns out that um, a late friend of Arno's, uh, Russell Ross, who worked on, he's been gone for 10 years now, I think, um, who worked, did very important work on um, athero atherosclerosis as an, infl an inflammatory process, and he used to write review articles on that. They got lots of citations. He is the most cited scientist ever at the University of Washington, and I'm, um, I'm not sure if I'm gaining on him or losing, losing to him, but that's the most, that's the most cited paper. So are there other things that you wanted to share particularly that I haven't brought out in your question? I think we've run the clock out and okay. run off the end of our list of questions. But uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, I do want to emphasize that the department has been very supportive, but it was just that for decades they were, I tried their patience. I mean, <laughs> I, I was working on this weird hobby called trees, and everybody was saying, well, we still pay them a salary. We're not quite sure why. Um, but they kept paying the salary, and they kept being nice to me, so that was that was helpful. You've been in that position a number of times in your career. In 91, when I was a student in the workshop on molecular evolution, you you said, I'm going to take an e evening slot when you guys should be going to the pub, and I'm going to give a talk on coalescence theory. I'd never heard of coalescence theory. I was newly in your lab. and You came, gave this talk. About 20 people came, and I'm sitting there thinking, I have no idea why I should care about this, but I'm a postdoc in this lab, so perhaps I'd better. <laughs> And you've been very willing to be out there talking about things where the rest of us have no idea what you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> and you've, it's paid off a number of times, and that was, that was certainly one of them, because 10 years later I was giving huge lectures on coalescent theory, and everyone was saying, well, yes, of course, this is important. It, yeah. it took you a while to convince me. In the Woods Hole workshop, I had to go to Mitch Sogan, who was running it, and say, can I give a talk on this in the evening? And he sort of said, uh, yeah, there's this room over there. You can go give it. And in subsequent years, I started doing things like taking one of the two slots where I talked and saying, I think instead of talking what to about what you want me to talk about, I will talk about coalescence. I did that for a number of years. And then finally, Mary took over and has been um, very successful at, at a number of different workshops at talking about that. Yeah, well, I guess it also means that I haven't been very good at, you know, coming up with a story that gets people um, standing on their chairs cheering because um, I have to do the thing and then wait and wait and wait for somebody. To, I'm not sure you, know. you had an alternative. I know that when you proposed the maximum likelihood method in phylogenetics, essentially the computer power to make it feasible wasn't really yeah. there yet. And it's hard to accept a method when you can't use it. Yeah, so I think, I think what happened there was I, I developed it because sequence data had come along, but it was very slow. And for several years, throughout five years, people said, well, it's a good method in theory, but you can never actually do it. And then, then they started doing it as computers got faster. That's where it just stopped. <laughs> <now. laughs> All right. So again, thank you very much. Really appreciate coming out here and talking. Thank you.